one in six people globally are going to be dealing with infertility. We can protect sperm quality, we can protect the morphology, and we can increase the chances that someone gets pregnant. You know, one in seven couples is infertile and it's becoming more and more of a crisis globally. Uh, fertility rights, rates have dropped 50% in the last 50 years and it's not getting any better. Yeah. And and the question is why? We have better food, we have better healthcare, we have better everything, and yet we're seeing, it's not just birth rates decline, because that could be people having less kids, but actual fertility. So can you kind of give us some insight into the real root causes of why we're seeing this decline in fertility? Yeah. I mean, there are three buckets that I talk about with my clients, um, and that's age. So we're having children later than our parents did on average between our 30s and 40s, where our parents might have had them younger between their 20s and 30s. And fertility rates do decline as we age. Um, but I think the bigger levers that we have the ability to pull on are our own health status and then oxidative stress. And so when you think about what causes chromosomal abnormalities and what causes this oxidative stress, it's a number of things. Um, it's going to be endocrine disrupting chemicals. It's going to be things like pesticides, PUFAs, BPA, things that you've talked about on this podcast a lot. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, all the only... petrochemical toxins that we're just exposed to in, in crazy amounts, right? Right. So you look at those three buckets. Um, and like you said earlier, I mean, the WHO had a really jarring stat earlier this year in April that said one in six people globally are going to be dealing with infertility at least once in their life. And when we look at men, men's sperm has dropped 62% since the early 70s. And women today who are 20, their fertility is less than their grandmother was at 35. So there's something here. What's causing all of these chromosomal abnormalities and it's the stress that our body is going under. So But is infertility just about the chromosomal stuff or is it there are other reasons for infertility, right? There are other reasons for infertility as well. You can go through undiagnosed um undiagnosed issues like polycystic ovarian syndrome, endometriosis, hypothyroidism, you have Hashimoto's, you have anemia, low iron status, high iron status, un, um, untreated undiagnosed oral infections and untreated and undiagnosed autoimmunity. So when you think about it, your body needs to be in a place of abundance and vitality. You have to have high nutrient status to get pregnant. And it was interesting that the journal, journal of Clinical Nutrition showed that women who are pregnant, 90% of us aren't getting the nutrients we need from food alone. So there's, there's a nutrient status issue and a health issue that we need to look at. And then it's the oxidative stress. And it's coming from both sides, men and women, right? We think that for a long time, it was just us women, but men play a role in this. And we're passing, we're both passing on our DNA for the child. Yeah, it's so true. I mean, I, I've seen this so much in my practice. And, you know, I just co-founded a company called Function Health, where we're doing, you know, wide scale screening of over 108 biomarkers for people that they can access directly from functionhealth.com without going through their doctor. And we started analyzing the data. We have over 20,000 people gone through at over a million data points. And it was shocking for me to find this is a health forward population. These are not people eating McDonald's, right? These are like, I'm going to be proactive. I'm, I take care of myself. I exercise. I eat healthy. You know, we saw dramatic amounts of nutritional deficiencies and particularly methylation, which is really critical for fertility and for, for preventing miscarriages, you know, B12, folate, B6. And people were really deficient in these. We saw very low levels of vitamin D, very low levels of iron. And these are things that are easily detected and treatable. So, I mean, I think there's there's a lot of things that have to do with our our poor nutritional quality, with insulin resistance, with just you know stress and and things that we can actually do something about. But then there's these these like you mentioned these environmental chemicals which are so disturbing. Um, I remember when I was uh, working at Canyon Ranch as a doctor, I was reading this book called Our Stolen Future by Theo Colburn. You know that book? Have you ever heard of that book? It was it blew my mind. It was basically a book about the roles of environmental chemicals in causing all these hormonal dysregulation issues, hormonal chaos. And, and essentially the hormone disruptors are these petrochemicals. Uh, they're, we call them xenoestrogens or xenobiotics. They, they're at 
in very infinitesimally small amounts, they're toxic. When you add them together, it's not like adding one plus one equals two. It's like one plus one equals a thousand. And they're ubiquitous. They're in all of our tissues and all of our organs. Our bodies store them in the fat. And, and this is driving huge problems with fertility. So I, I think there's so many issues that are out there. And, and the good news is that, that people don't have to um, just sit there and be passive acceptors of this infertility issue. And it's not just about getting IVF or getting fertility treatments. It's about dealing with these root causes. And most fertility doctors don't actually do this. And, and so that's why functional medicine is so important. And what you do is so important because it helps us to think about it. So, um, you know, tell us more about how, how these toxins and forever chemicals impact fertility, uh, for men and women. I touched on a little bit, but maybe you can give us a little deeper understanding of how that works. Yeah, well, you hit the nail on the head. Um, they can act like xenoestrogens in the body, but there was actually a recent public published study out of Mount Sinai that looked at over a thousand women and it researched uh, blood levels of PUFAs between 2015 and 2017. And they found up to a 40% decrease in fertility. And so that can be overwhelming because you hear the word endocrine disrupting chemicals, forever chemicals, they're omnipresent, they're in everything from your nonstick cookware, waterproof clothing, the lycra, food packaging, the lining inside your coffee cup, coatings on your carpet, upholstery, you're like, Wait, my whole life is covered in this stuff. But the, the, I, what I always like to give is a promise of hope. And that is when we look at urine excretions of PUFAs, if someone removes, um, these endocrine disrupting chemicals, they can see the decrease of the urine excretion of PUFAs by half within a few days or a week. So we have so much power in our ability to make decisions around these forever chemicals that cause oxidative stress to our body and our, you know, future, the DNA that we'd be passing down for future children. So when it comes to these types of chemicals, there are so many things you can do from using, storing your food in glass, swapping out nonstick cookware, um, even just taking a stainless steel coffee mug to your coffee shop or sitting down and having it in, instead of in a to-go mug, in a to-go cup, um, have it at the coffee shop, avoiding those plastic water bottles. A lot of these like PUFAs, these are made to make things resistant to water, oil, and grease, whereas phthalates make plastic malleable. Um, free things you can do, open your windows, take your shoes off at your door. Um, all of these are going to lower a lot of those forever chemicals that are making their way into our house. You know, it is critical in those three months or four months prior to conception to really think about, well, where would I be coming in contact with these things the most? Um, and how do I lower my exposure to them because we do have so much power in the decisions we're making every single day. It's true. You know, it's, it's, it's what we're eating. It's what we're, we're eating from like the containers, right? It's our household cleaning products and it's our body care products. And, and those things we have control of, and you know, I don't know if you know this, but I'm on the board of the environmental working group. And well, there you go, there's skin a, deep. There's, <laughs> yeah, skin deep. And you go to ewg.org and they have guides on body care products, household cleaning products, what foods, vegetables, fruits, animal products, how to reduce your exposures from every potential source of environmental chemicals. And so you can't be perfect, but it's something you can actually have a fair bit of impact. In. And like you say, if you reduce these consciously, you see a drop in the urine levels very quickly. Now, um, Kelly, you know, most of the fertility doctors focus on women, but the truth is, uh, it takes two. <laughs> and, uh, and even though men are 50% of the equation, they're not really often considered. Even 25% of the men in infertility couples are not even evaluated as part of dealing with infertility. So, you know, what are, what are your thoughts for how men need to think about fertility too? And how, how they need to think about improving their likelihood of, of uh, conceiving a baby with their partner? Yeah, well, men are 50% of the equation and how their lifestyle factors, how they're taking care of their, themselves, their nutrient status, their health is going to have an epigenetic effect on the DNA that they're passing down. And so it's critically important that they take care of themselves, especially during that um, spermatogenesis period, which is about around 74 days on average to produce sperm. And so for men, um, fertility does drop and it, and it drops about 52% in their early to, um, to mid thirties. And so just like women we're they're experiencing a drop in fertility around the same amount of time. And what we've seen in studies over and over and over again, is that introducing antioxidants into the diet. These are, you know, leafy greens, things that are going to provide vitamin C, um, 
you know, your wild uh, fish, your um, your lean pasture raised meats, all the things you talk about. Even when you think about your book, Forever Young, a lot of those steps. Young that forever, young forever. That was Bob younger. Dylan. That was well, Bob, Bob Dylan. Dylan. <laughs> yeah. When you think about all of the ways that we are protecting our own health, we're protecting our men are protecting their sperm's health. And so when we look at it, we can see that vitamin C, vitamin E, L-carnitine, zinc, all of these nutrients are critical in producing um, sperm. And when we look at sperm, we're looking at quantity, we're looking at morphology, we're looking at DNA, and their lifestyle is impacting it. You know, we look at the research and we can find that men who walk over 4,000 steps a day versus those who have less than 4,000 steps a day have an increase in their, ter their testosterone levels. But what's so interesting is a thousand more steps a day on top of that 4,000 increases testosterone, seven nanograms per milliliter. And when you look at that, that's pretty powerful. Like getting out there and getting active increases the quality of your sperm that you're passing on to your children. And testosterone does that, which is so great because we have power to make these healthy choices, to increase the nutrients and antioxidants on our plate, to move our bodies, to sleep, to decrease stress. You know, I think we forget that stress doesn't just come in the form of endocrine disrupting chemicals and in the form of our lifestyle choices or undiagnosed issues. It's coming um, psychologically too. And sleep and activity really combat that. And it, it is just equally as equally as important for the man and the woman to get active and get healthy together prior to conception. And it definitely exercise helps, but watching sports may not because uh, <laughs> one, one study actually showed that if your team won, uh, your testosterone level went up. But if your team lost in the sports game, your testosterone level went down. <laughs> so oh <my> better <laughs> exercise. Yeah. Now, one one of the things uh that that's important is is um sperm quality and and you know i think you know people think oh you know men don't really have a time clock right they're not they don't have a biological clock but they do and and yet men can conceive i think the oldest man ever to conceive was 96 which i think is pretty impressive but but it's uh it's not the same as men get older in terms of the quality of the sperm, their fertility rates, or the consequences for their offspring. I mean, I think we see more autism rates with older fathers. So um, what, can you tell us more about man's sperm health and why we see this decline and, and what do we know about how to address it? Yeah, well, one study looked at like the genetic changes in sperm health from young men um, to older men. And what we see is um, you are, you are going to see the DNA involved there is going to have an increased risk of autism, Alzheimer's, type 2 diabetes, um, even heart disease. And, and when those genes are implicated based on the a man's lifestyle choices, they're actually passing that down to their children. And if they end up having a baby girl, they're actually passing those genetic changes down to their grandchildren. And so what we really want to do for men is to increase the antioxidant status. When we look at men who increase their antioxidant status by taking things like L-carnitine, vitamin C, zinc, all of those nutrients of concern that I talked about, even CoQ10. CoQ10 is shown to improve sperm concentration, quality, motility, and morphology. And when you pair that with B12, it actually improves um, DNA, uh, lowers the rate of DNA damage, which is also really impressive because we have this control. We can add NAC to our diet. We can look at our vitamin D status in the same way women will prior to pregnancy. It's equally as important. And I think this research is building and building. And that's why you see companies like We Natal, which I know, you know, both of us, both of us love very much coming out with a prenatal for men because we can protect sperm quality. We can protect the morphology and we can increase the chances that someone gets pregnant. And actually men on antioxidants, they have a four times higher rate of getting pre getting their wife pregnant and a five times higher rate of that woman having a live birth when they're taking antioxidants prior to conception. Uh, yeah, I, I think that's a very important point. And in fact, just full disclosure, I'm an advisor to We Natal. I really believe in this. And I, I, I became an advisor because I, I really understood this from my own practice as a functional medicine doctor and treating infertile couples. And I would treat both the men and the women and i would see really much greater results so i think it's very important and i think you know what you're saying also is important to emphasize which is that it's these simple things just simple nutrients that are safe and 
well-tolerated and inexpensive can have a profound effect on sperm quality, sperm health, and the outcome of, uh, of, of, of a pregnancy, which is just remarkable to me. And, and, and people think, oh, vitamins, minerals, how powerful are they? I just, I just want to share a little story here because I think it kind of speaks to the power of really digging into learning how to take the right nutrients for you. <clears throat> I was uh, in a film called Fed Up years ago, about a decade ago. And in the filmmaker, uh, the director of the film was a woman who had had recurrent miscarriages. She had recurrent miscarriages. Not only that, she'd had, you know, stillbirth. She had uh, an anencephalic birth, which is really a horrible experience where there's a baby, but there's no brain. So it's, it's, it pr was pretty traumatic for her. <clears throat> and she read this article that I wrote on methylation. Now, for those of you listening, you know what that is. It's essentially a chemical process that requires B12, folate, and B6. And it's involved in everything from gene expression and regulation to neurotransmitter function, to energy production, to detoxification. So it's, it's a critical process in the body. And, and so she read this article and she went to her doctor and she said, Hey, can you test me for something called homocysteine, which Dr. Hyman says is the way to best test for this. And he did. And she had a very high level. And he's, he's, she said, well, can you test me for the gene that regulates my homocysteine level? And he did. And she had the abnormal gene that made it hard for her to do this chemical process. And he says, okay, I'll just give you some folic acid. And she's like, no, no, no. Dr. Hyman says I need this special kind of folic acid and this form of B12 and this form of B6. And, and, uh, so she took it and during the, uh, promotion of the film as we were driving around New York in the, in the taxis and going to the different events. Uh, she had a healthy baby that she was nursing in the taxis. And it was a result of, of actually simply taking the right nutrients that were for her that helped optimize her chance of having a healthy baby. So, uh, people don't even realize that frequent miscarriages can be just simple as that. Just take the right B vitamins, take the right nutrients and, and you will prevent that. Uh, so it, it's 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 such a dramatic story, but it's it's very compelling. Well, I have to chime in here because this is one of the biggest red, red flags for me when I'm working with a client who's taking a prenatal that is using folic acid, because 50% of us don't have the ability to take that folic acid and make it the methylated active form. And what you're talking about is her experience. And unfortunately, even research now is showing that babies are being born with unmethylated folic acid in their bloodstream. And if this yeah. isn't, if we're not able to use this, it's going to have implications on health and it's showing up in research in that way. And so, um, and your, your point on homocysteine, I mean, that's going to create an imbalance in hormones and increases chances of, of, of miscarriage. So it's, you're pointing right to the source. And this is as simple as turn that prenatal around and look, do you have a methylated form of folic, of folate or are you using folic acid? And if you're using folic acid, make the switch. Yeah, that's exactly right. And in, in, in function health, one of the things we measured was homocysteine, which your doctor should own check. And about 15% of the population had elevated homocysteine which is one in seven people, which is about the amount of people who are infertile. Now that that's not saying that that's the cause, but it's, it's just, it was just shocking to see that for me. I was like, wow, this is a lot of people who are having this and are not being treated. So in terms of, in terms of uh, preparing for pregnancy and preconception, you know, people don't often thought, think about that. They think about oh, getting pregnant and then what happens after, but actually it's just as important to understand how to prepare yourself to be pregnant. And I think about like preparing the garden. When you want to grow a garden, you've got to prepare the soil. You want to make sure it's got the right compost in it and the right nutrients in it and it's watered properly and everything's ready to plant the seed. We, we don't do that in medicine. We just like, okay, get pregnant and then take your multivitamin. And well, it should not be that way. And I think this is really important to think about. So can you talk about the whole concept of preconception and how we prepare for pregnancy? Right. Well, it's now a big buzz term, trimester zero, preconception, your primester, it's the three months prior, trimester. <laughs> three months prior to conception. Um, but I actually take it a step further and I take it back six months. And I say this from actual personal experience. I've had four pregnancies and three healthy little boys. And my first pregnancy happened actually on my first book tour. Um, you know, a lot of travel, a lot of stress, eating out, um, but excited. You know, a lot of us have 
big, want to have big careers and we extended education and then get married and then have babies. The day you want to have a baby, you want to be pregnant. And, um, but there is something to putting in the time to ensure the highest quality outcomes. And so six months out, this is the time to take inventory over your own health. This is, you know, I love your company function. You can go on there. I would say, get a thyroid panel, make sure any form of low thyroid is going to increase your chances of a miscarriage. Check your iron levels. Look at um, your female sex hormones. We're going to look at follicle stimulating hormone to see if there's any you know chance of PCOS. You want to look at prolactin. Prolactin causes an imbalance and can create infertility. Um, you want to look at homocysteine levels. You want to look inflammatory markers. Um, this is blood test is the, is a great place to start for both parties and understanding like where do we stand where is our health and if there are any autoimmune antibodies to try and work and lowering them by working on your gut health and cleaning up your diet um incorporating things that are supportive of healing leaky gut and pulling out the things that break our body down because if we can go into pregnancy strong whether that's you know what you eat and 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 lifting heavy and sleeping well um you you're going to do and have the best outcomes but 6 months out 6 months out is good because then we're getting those blood tests we're understanding where we are and we can take some active steps towards those 3 months prior to conception because it's the 3 months prior to conception 100 days for an egg 74 days on average for sperm yeah. where we're able to yeah. increase those nutrient levels yes that's that's such an important point because think about the egg and the sperm that you're delivering to be the baby, right? That is determined by what you ate, by your stress levels, by your nutritional status, all of it. And if you don't have good sperm and egg, then it's less likely to have a healthy baby. So 100% agree. And it's again, something I never learned in medical school, we don't talk about, but it's actually really important. And, uh, you know, you mentioned about the testing and, it, you know, what we found was 12% of people have elevated thyroid antibodies, which the people are walking around 12% with an autoimmune thyroid issue that can actually affect fertility. And it, even if your quote, nor, other thyroid tests are normal, if your antibodies are high, there's something nasty going on and it could have an impact. And I actually have had many women I've helped get pregnant by giving them thyroid hormone. It's really quite amazing. You give them a little thyroid hormone and boom, they're pregnant. So I think, I think we really, uh, in fact, it's one of the things fertility doctors do. They often give T3 hormones. So I think it's such a critical thing to think about and to think about this preconception period and get the right testing to look at your health and upgrade your health in every way. So <clears throat> you mentioned a few of the labs, but I think, you know, the function health panel is an easy way to get pretty much everything you need from your vitamin D, to your hormone levels, to your thyroid antibodies, autoimmune markers, to nutritional levels, and all the things we talked about. People can go to functionhealth.com. You make a good point because I don't think people, what you've given people with function health is the ability to almost see a functional MD and get all of these tests without seeing, you know, a lot of times it's overwhelming for someone to walk into their OB. And I can say this personally, I have a wonderful OB, but to go into a doctor with a, a laundry list of, of tests that you want on top of a regular Quest Health panel and that... Um, it, it also can aggravate the relationship a little bit because the doctor thinks that you're questioning their expertise in that specific area. Yeah, but you don't need that test. So that's not necessary. Or why do you want that? Or that's going to be extra money or what, you know, or I, the, the other thing is, I don't know what that means. And I don't, I'm embarrassed because I won't know how to interpret it. So I'm not going to order any. You know, it's like right. Right. And this is a great way to stand up and say, you know, you can take care of it yourself with, yeah. with that type of a panel. Absolutely yeah, that's amazing. Like in terms of the um, the diet and lifestyle that the parents have, you know, how does that influence the genetics of the that they pass on to their baby? Because we think genes are pretty fixed, but can you talk a little bit about this concept of epigenetics and pregnancy and why this matters and why why we need to think carefully about what we're doing while we're pregnant or before we get pregnant that regulates our epigenome and how that affects fertility and the health of the baby? Yes. Um you know, as a mom who's delivered three babies, I've been through pregnancy. I know it can be really difficult in the first trimester. You can have food aversions, um, you can have cravings, but unfortunately, the epigenetics of what we do prior to conception and during conception is actually such a vulnerable period of time. It's probably the most powerful time we have of influencing our child's life. And it's the most um, delicate time in which our epigenetics 
decisions have the most powerful effect. And so, for example, I work with clients to regulate their blood sugar during during pregnancy. And I wrote an entire course on how to kind of get through those food aversions and to increase nutrient status and to check in with yourself when the first trimester is over and make sure everything is good because we know elevated blood sugar during pregnancy increases your child's chances of metabolic syndrome and type 2 diabetes in their lifetime. And so it isn't this free-for-all free period to make unhealthy choices and not um, and not check in with yourself. Now, being that I'm a woman who's been through it, I know what it feels like to not want to look at protein. And I'm in my kitchen cooking for my family a lot of the times here. But it it that's why the preconception period is so critically important because you can work your stores, your nutrients up, you can protect the DNA. And you know, the st- when studies do look at how our sperm DNA and egg DNA is impacted by our epigenetics, I mean, it is linked to everything. Like I said, risk of autism, Alzheimer's, OCD, um, obesity, type two diabetes, and and these are we're we're giving our child the chance at the at. The, their best life, and we're already in contact with all these endocrine disrupting chemicals and things that are stressful on our own um, DNA. So it's really, really important that we're trying our best. Um, you know, one of the things, depending on the person's relationship with health tech, like I love an aura ring as a way to motivate someone to get into bed earlier, to track their movement. It's also a great investment you can make prior to conception because you can use an aura ring and natural cycles to understand when you're ovulating and a change in um, um, basal, you know, basal temperature and all of that. So there are ways that we can protect our the DNA we're passing down to our child and then protect their their DNA through our epigenetic, through our lifestyle choices, which impact our epigenetics and thus their epigenetics. Yeah. So, so I think what you said was just so important. I want to recap a little bit because people may not understand what epigenetics is. Uh, I wrote a lot about it in Young Forever, but essentially, you know, your genes are fixed. You can't really change those, but which genes are expressed, turned on or off is regulated by everything you do, what you eat, what you think, uh, your activity levels, environmental toxins, your microbiome, your nutrient status, et cetera, et cetera. And it's something you have control over for the most part. It's what we call the exposome, everything your genes are exposed to, which determines about 90% of your health. And what happens is when, when you look at the data around pregnancy and epigenetics, uh, it's, it's actually quite terrifying as I've looked into it. You know, when, when women are unhealthy going into pregnancy, when they're obese or when they have diabetes or when they have various kinds of inflammatory issues, when their diet's crappy, they end up causing epigenetic marks or tags on the genes of their infants in utero. And then that affects them developmentally and throughout their health and their long-term risk of disease. So what that means is, you know, you, 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 the epigenetics are like the piano player that your genes are like your piano keys. So, you know, you can play an infinite variety of songs with piano keys from all kinds of different types of music, but, but that's what your epigenome does. So, you know, it can code for optimal health and robust metabolism, or it can code for genes and turn on the genes that are going to make you obese and diabetic and have your risk risk of heart disease or cancer or Alzheimer's, as you mentioned. So it's really important. And I think kind of preparing the oven for the baby is really key and keeping the oven good while, while the baby's in there is really important. It's not trivial. And I think, you know, it's, it's heartbreaking for me because I see, you know, the, the incredible amount of illnesses and suffering our kids have now. We see obesity go up. It's 75% of the population is overweight, 42% obese, and 40% of our kids are overweight now. And their mortality rate is high. If, if you're obese as a kid, your risk of death is, you know, it's much higher. Your life expectancy is 13 years less. That's a lot. And, and, and so we, we have an influence over that. It's not to shame people into getting healthy, but it's important to understand that if you're going to have children and you don't want to have kids who are sick or who have ADD or autism or who have allergies or autoimmunity or obesity or worse, you, know, you need to think about how to actually optimize your health before the baby's born and before you get pregnant and, and optimize your own health first. And that's why I think we need, we natal is so important because it kind of brings in the concept of how do we, how do we actually optimize our health? It's not just taking the, the specialized, uh, prenatal and 
I don't know what you call it, what, what you call them now, pre, prenatal vitamins, <laughs> you know, uh, antenatal vitamins. Or, <laughs> but but it, basically, you, you, you need to think about optimizing your health through through diet and lifestyle, through the right supplements, through getting the right tests, as we mentioned, and, you know, checking things that maybe you're not getting checked by your doctor, like your thyroid antibodies, like your homocysteine level, like vitamin D levels, like other nutrient status, and, and basically making sure that everything is in balance before you before you try. And by the way, when you do these things, if you're having infertility problems, it, it's likely to fix them. Right. Well, and I think that that is what can be so discouraging for people who are on an infertility journey or, or having a hard time conceiving. Um, you know, I've walked alongside friends and clients who've, who've dealt with that and I've been, you know, had a miscarriage myself and it's, it is overwhelming. And when you go down a traditional route, I mean, there's, um, you know, there's pharmaceuticals that can help with ovulation and then you have IUI and IVF, but no one's addressing those root cause issues that may be imbalancing hormones that may have, you know, implications on DNA. And you might make a really good point that it's, it is that, it is that time prior to conception, but also for men, if, if, if your partner, if you can just get your partner to commit to that period of time when their sperm is um, being developed, those 74 days prior to when you want to try. So think three months prior to when you want to try. There was a really amazing study, not just on women, but for men, when you're talking about turning the volume down on these genes, if a man exercises twice a week, high intensity exercise, only twice a week, they have the ability to silence the genes that pass down type two diabetes, obesity, and um, Alzheimer's. So that's powerful stuff right there. And if you, they may not want to eat this the way you want to eat throughout your whole pregnancy, but get them on board for that, that preconception period of time, because it is, it is pretty critical. And I remember when Chris and I were first trying to get pregnant, um, you know, I had him on a high dose, dose omega three. I had him on NAC. I had him on antioxidants, a, a, a functional multivitamin. I didn't have access to a men's prenatal. I joke um, that it's a, a he natal and a she natal. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but it is important to protect that DNA integrity prior to conception. Yeah, totally. And, uh, and that's why thinking about this holistically is really important rather than just saying, I need IVF or I can't, you know, so I think it's really cool. So, um, what have you learned in terms of the supplementation market? Like, how do we how do we know which is a good and bad prenatal vitamin? Because I've been dealing with this for for decades with my patients, and my I used to be uh, you know um, well I'm still a family doctor, but I used to deliver a lot of babies. I delivered over 500 babies. I I loved OB, and I and I, I was very involved in this. And I and I help and then subsequently a lot of women deal with with figuring out what to take. And so part of it's testing and figuring out what you need and what's right for you. But, but there are, there are real quality differences and there's real differences in the ingredients. And like you said, you know, before, if you don't take the right type of folic acid, then it may not work and it may even cause more problems for the baby or for you. So how do you kind of navigate this and how do you determine, you know, how to tell good ones from bad ones? Right. So first and foremost, the supplement industry is not regulated. So you want to look for something that has third-party testing. I think that that's really important. You want to guarantee that what you're taking is in your multivitamin or your prenatal. Um, second, you want to look for methylated forms. We talked about this. So you're looking for five, um, the, for the active form of folate versus folic acid. So methyl tetrahydrofolate. Um, versus folic acid. So that should be a, a one thing to look for. Next, you want to look for um, the number and quantity of nutrients. So another thing that I have clients look for, it's almost like a little checklist. Is it third-party tested? Do you have methylated B vitamins in there? Look for B6 because we talked about it earlier. It helps to balance female sex hormones and ensure that there is an excess homocysteine in the body. Um, you also want to look for choline. You know, there are a number of prenatals on the market that still don't include choline and choline is critical for neural development for a baby and yeah, for the brain. Exactly. And a lot of prenatals don't even have choline, but what we found in, in the latest research is that for pregnant women, it's 450 milligrams. And for lactating women, it's 550 milligrams. And if you look at breast milk two years after birth, choline levels stay 
stay high. They don't drop over time. And the majority of women between the ages of 20 and 40 are getting less than 300 milligrams of choline a day. And choline is really only coming from eggs and pastured meat, specifically things like liver, where a lot of us aren't eating that type of thing. And if there's any sardines, we don't forget sardines. Don't forget sardines. (laughs) (laughs) But these are these, you know, I don't want to say gamey. But there might, they might just be more prevalent in a, mm. a really health-focused person who knows the nutrient density of sardines, beef liver, egg yolks, and they're not afraid of eating those things. For But we see when we look at the stats, it's, it's less than 300 milligrams. And, and this is, you know, choline, is, I, I always tell my clients, it's like the Uber driver that drives DHA to the brain for your child. And those two nutrients are so critical for neurodevelopment in utero. And when you think about that, and um, another thing to think about is like iron levels, does it have, you know, iron biglycinate in it? Because iron, suboptimal iron levels in utero and when a child is developing in the first year of life, that's why we we prick a child at their one-year birthday checkup with a pediatrician to check their iron status because we know it has um, irreversible IQ decline issues. So yeah, yeah. like these are so important for their for the future of this world and, and their their ability to have the best life that they can have. And we can we can take a nutrient or a prenatal that supports that. Yeah, I think that's really important. You mentioned a few things that are not typically in prenatals, right? So fish oil is not typically in prenatal, though there's some now that are recognizing adding that. And particularly with levels of DHA that are important for brain development in kids. And and you said you gave it to your husband and you took it before and you should take it during and you, your kid needs it after. And, you know, it's the old cod liver oil thing, which is actually a great idea because you get vitamin D, you get vitamin A, you get, you get the omega-3s. But the the uh, the right levels usually are not in the prenatals, and choline is usually not in there, and the right form of methylated vitamins is not in there, and these these are really essential if you want to have a healthy baby, and it's just, and and often you know as a doctor I learned to prescribe the usual prescription multivitamin, which basically insurance pays for, but the ones that insurance pays for are generally pretty poor in terms of their quality of the ingredients, and it's not just the you know the whether it's you know the right form it's also you know how they're manufactured are they tableted and so thick that they don't digest in your belly are are the blood levels right are the forms of the nutrients the right and if you take magnesium oxide that doesn't get absorbed certain forms of iron don't get absorbed as well as others the right forms of methylated new vitamins and b vitamins all this really matters and and uh, you want to make sure there's no colors and dyes. And if there's a blue vitamin, like why is there a blue vitamin? It's no blue vitamin <laughs> naturally. So you don't want to be taking all that stuff, and and you want to be really smart about it. And I think it's it's really important to find the right products. And to, 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 to unfortunately, it's not typically something that most doctors learn much about. It's like oh, get a prenatal vitamin. Just here's a prescription one. This is what I learned in medical school, and that's it. And it's kind of how I did it when I first started practicing. Until I started learning about it, I was like oh. Is not all the same. Right. I think, you know, you make a good point about like a big tablet or, you know, that that's one of the things too, is I'll work with clients and they have a really, you know, they may have a hard time taking their prenatal. Um, and so they don't take it or they pick something that is maybe two pills. And we look at the composition of that prenatal and it's half the nutrients and at lower doses, and yes, that's going to get you somewhere. But when we look at blood levels of women who are unsupplemented, some supplemented during their pregnancy, you're going to see blood levels drop in vitamin A, C, D, K, all the B vitamins. Um, and that's, you know, you're, you're giving it all away, all of your nutrient stores, everything that you're eating to the baby. And we're seeing that show up in your blood, which doesn't leave you in a good place when it comes to postpartum, especially because some of us a a lot of us are, when we do decide to have children, maybe we're having them a little bit later and we're having multiples. And we know that, that, you know, for me, at least personally, I've had three babies in less than five years between the ages of 35 and 40. And they've been back to back followed by 18 (laughs) months, 22 months of breastfeeding. And, and that's like being an athlete. You have to take your nutrition seriously, your supplementation seriously, yeah. seriously, your sleep seriously. I have been on the other side of postpartum depletion. It does not feel good, but I will tell you. That's different you, than depression, right? Depletion is different than depression because people have heard yes. of postpartum depression, 
which by the way, is often caused by omega-3 deficiency because your omega-3, you know, your baby's a parasite essentially. So it'll suck everything out of you. And, and breast milk is one of the highest sources of omega-3 fats. But if you haven't been eating the right omega-3s and you're low, it's going to suck yours out. And that's really critical for mood. So we do know that fish oil can be a really great treatment for postpartum depression. But uh, tell me more about this postpartum depletion thing, because I think that's a concept most people have not heard about. Post, yeah, postnatal depletion is this, uh, it's a kind of an epidemic happening in women who are having back to back children and breastfeeding who haven't supplemented appropriately or aren't eating nutrient dense foods or have an absorption issue. And what ends up happening is in the postnatal um, period, those three months prior to um, giving birth, you have a lot of symptoms, major mood swings. And, and the thing is, is, Part of it is normal and natural, but I think we're normalizing all of our hair falling out, our nails brittle, our skin dry, um, major night sweats. Like some of it is normal in a specific period of time, but postnatal depletion is is something that I even personally was affected by. And you're going to see low levels of nutrient status on blood tests. I I felt like I was eating appropriately, and I focus on lean animal meats and nutrient dense. I'm adding liver to my diet, but even so was seeing, um, that my nutrient status and my B vitamins, um, all of my omega threes were low. And I actually had to get to a point where I was taking a high dose, close to 5,000 IUs or 6,000 IUs of vitamin D a day on top of eating a vitamin D rich diet and getting some sun exposure. So it's amazing how much they will take from you <laughs> when they're inside of you and when you're breastfeeding, because there are certain nutrients that just don't decline in breast milk. And thus you're giving your, your child all of that nutrition. Yeah. So it is important, you know, to, to make sure you take care of yourself, particularly after you have babies for sure. Um, I, I think, you know, for those listening, you know, pregnancy, babies, having a family is, is, is really an important thing. And like we said at the beginning, the infertility crisis is getting greater and greater. And, and, and it's complicated. It's, it's our high sugar processed diet. And, and I think there was, a, I think there was a great book by Walter Willett called The Fertility Diet, talking about how insulin resistance is a big driver of infertility, environmental chemicals, nutritional deficiencies. This sort of one in five women have thyroid dysfunction. Half of them are not diagnosed. There's so many things that you can do to upgrade your health. They will optimize your chance of getting pregnant and having a healthy baby and a healthy pregnancy. And these are just some of the things we talked about. This is obviously a much more potentially deeper subject and longer conversation. Um, but I, but I do think it's important for people to focus on what they have control over and, and what they have control over is their lifestyle, their diet, ex exercise, reducing their environmental chemicals by maybe checking out ewg.org and changing out your household cleaning products, your skincare products, your, your food that you're buying and eating, obviously organic clearly matters. Um, and, and also taking the right multivitamin, uh, and prenatal vitamins is really key. And I think that's, you know, Mark Kelly and I both get behind we natal, which is great. If you love that last video, you're going to love the next one. Check it out here. Now there's some genetics involved. There may be a family history of thyroid issues. It's common as we get older, um, you know, over 60, but the issue is why are we seeing this increase? prevalence. I mean, it, it's, it's in the population. It's always been, but it seems to be increasing. So why is that? 